Hello, and welcome to the Physique Development Podcast. I'm here with Coach Caleb joining us back on the podcast. Um, If you haven't listened to his other episode, um, he has had a coach spotlight, as all of the coaches have, but we also did an episode on why execution matters, why you should film yourself, and talking through the hurdles of getting over filming yourself in the gym. Um, So, Caleb, say hey. (laughs) Hello. (laughs) <laughs> um, so if you haven't listened to that podcast, definitely give that one a listen because it is so extremely helpful. But we're talking about another extremely helpful topic today. There's a trend going on with our podcast, very helpful topics. Um, but we're talking about stress, which I'm sure anyone who clicked on this and saw the title were like, oh my gosh, I need this because we're going to talk about stress management specifically. But before we dive into stress management, I think that it's important to talk about the effects of stress on your body and to give you or to open your eyes as to why you might need to manage your stress or even pay attention to it. Because I'll speak for myself. I know I had chronic unaddressed and a stress I wasn't even aware was weighing on me for multiple, multiple years. And that was something where there were so many things popping up in my life. And I was like, "Ugh, what's going on? And now looking back, it's so easy to see, oh, you just weren't managing your stress or, oh, that were that was the effects of stress. Um, and I'm sure Caleb can <laughs> say the same for himself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so when it comes to stress, when you think of stress, you kind of think of like an emoji of like pulling its hair out and just like lightning bolts coming from your head. And you can like feel that sizzle of stress in your body. We all know what stress feels like, but oftentimes we don't know what stress looks like or understand it in the moment. Now, some stress is very obvious of, hey, I have a deadline for work. I'm stressed about it. Or I have this decision I have to make and I'm stressed about it. But how often when someone says, hey, how are you doing? You're like, oh, I'm good. Just stressed or just you know, getting through just stressed and you don't even know what you're stressed about. So I do want to kind of open your eyes to what stress looks like, as well as being able to look at the common effects of stress. So when we're looking at stress, something that you'll hear us say when we're talking about the sympathetic um, nervous system is there's going to be the parasympathetic or the central nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. So when we're looking at parasympathetic, that's rest and digest. We love that shit. That's what we want to be in predominantly. But then there's going to be that parasympathetic, which is that fight or flight. So with that fight or flight, you might think, oh my gosh, okay, yeah, that's when I'm running from a bear. I feel that stress. But in today's society, our body doesn't always understand, hey, I'm running from a bear. This is stress versus um, I'm stressed about this conversation I have to have. I'm stressed about work. I'm stressed about X, Y, and Z. So that instinct still feels like, oh my gosh, I'm running from a bear. And again, you might not always perceive it that way. And when you leave stress unchecked, it can contribute to so many different health problems. So it could be something of, hey, I have headache. I have constant muscle tension or pain. I have fatigue. My sex drive is different. I have an upset stomach. My sleep is disrupted. I have anxiety. I have restlessness, lack of motivation, focus, feeling overwhelmed, irritable, angry, depressed, sad. Um, I might be overeating or undereating. I might be having outbursts, misusing things like um, drugs or alcohol, having a social, social withdrawal or exercising less often. So all of those things might be happening. And as I'm saying this, you might be nodding your head along of like, oh, yeah, <laughs> Those are like very prevalent in my day-to-day life. That's likely stress that has gone unchecked or unaddressed to some degree. Now, one thing I do want to mention within stress, and I always like to mention this because within clients, a lot of times these five things happen and they try to downplay the stress that is happening. So when we look at the five most stressful events that can happen in your life, those are going to be death of a loved one or sickness of a loved one, um, divorce, moving, a major illness or injury, and then job loss. And obviously, throughout the past few years, those have been even more prevalent in regards to uh, COVID and where the nation has been. And so that is even harder of that stress kind of piling on top um, and feeling like, oh my gosh, when is this going to end? There's so much going on. And oftentimes, again, we 
try to minimize what our stress is so much that we don't even address it. So within that, what I want to you to take from that or what can be very helpful for you and what we often recommend for clients when it comes to stress is instead of just saying, oh, I'm stressed, dive into that a little bit deeper. I often have clients make a list of what are the five to 10 things that you are actively stressed about right now because that makes them put it on paper and makes them have to dissect what's going on instead of just defaulting to I'm stressed because you also have to be able to take inventory and take ownership of how much you participate in your own suffering. So you might feel like, oh man, I am like, having a hard time seeing progress forward. I feel overwhelmed and anxious all day long and a million other things. And you have to realize how much you're taking, um, you're a part of your own suffering by just not addressing things in your day-to-day life. So if you don't address it, it's not going to be fixed. What gets measured gets managed. And so within that, being able to make a list of those five to 10 things that are stressing you, just again, to put it on paper and then to go through it and list what you can do about it. So we're going to actually talk about that a lot here of how to manage that stress or different techniques you can use when it comes to managing stress that can be very, very helpful to minimize that. So I know I just talked for a little bit of a tangent there, but I think there are important points. Um, So I am going to go ahead and pass it over to Caleb. Anything you want to add to kind of what I've said about the effects of stress and what that does to your body, as well as being able to lead us into some information and some techniques when it comes to stress management? Yeah, I think um, from the perspective of what does stress do to our body and what does it look like, um, and even our common reaction to it of kind of downplaying it and participating or contributing to our own suffering, uh, I think you covered it all very well. I wouldn't add anything. Um, and then the one thing that I might add with re- and kind of segueing into what we're talking about today is actually with respect to um, <clears throat> the when you listed the five main things that are going to be stressful in our life in our life on average, those kind of things, if we handle them appropriately and kind of just live our life through them are going to be like acute stress. And we can't really avoid acute stress in that way. And, um, often the key to acute stress is going through it, not going around it or avoiding it, but just living that exact thing that's happening to you. So if someone, um, if you lose a loved one in your life, you've lost them and you're, you're going to work through that. Whereas what a lot of these stress management techniques that I'm going to talk about today are a lot around chronic stress. And when things are kind of consistently and perpetually stressing us out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when it comes to those things that are perpetually stressing us out, I definitely want to know what is the most effective way to manage that. But at the same time, before I ask that question, I think it's important to ask the question of how much does someone's own mentality go into that aspect of stress when it comes to that more chronic stress? Mm -hmm. I think everyone's so different and the way they can kind of contribute to that, their own mentality with respect to stress, um, can really contribute a lot. Um, it's, I'm kind of chuckling at it because I mean, there are so many different ways. So on one hand, we could complain about the stress a lot, and that can be something that is our kind of let's say our default coping mechanism. And if we complain a lot about it, it's going to be stressful. Another thing, it could be avoidance and pretending it's not there and that's going to be stressful. So, and then also stress is in, in a lot of ways. And what we're talking about today with respect to kind of mental or psychological stress, because we're really talking about how do you manage that? And, um, a big part of managing that is between your ears kind of, and in that case, your mentality and the way that you address it is likely going to be the main factor in how that impacts you. And then that can create physical, physiological cascades. Yeah. So everyone's going to experience stress, but you can experience it in a more positive light if you address it and don't go through these other things that you were just mentioning, correct? Yeah. Perfect. So what is the most effective way to manage stress? (laughs) Um, 
uh, well, the most effective way to manage stress is usually the hardest way to manage stress, which is to remove the stress. So um, the first thing that you should be considering when something is chronically stressing you out and you may not be able to do this most of the time or any of the time potentially, but the first thing you need to consider is, can I get rid of this? Can I eliminate this stressor from my life? Yeah. And like you said, it can be very hard and that's going to be one of the hardest things to do because some of that also takes the awareness of the fact that it either can be removed or you have the power to do something about it. Um, I'm going to make a generalization, but generally speaking, a lot of times people like to stew in their own stress. They like it, but they don't like it. They like to say that they're stressed. They like to have either people feel bad for them. They like to hold on to that security blanket of I'm stressed and they don't like to address it. And so removing it makes it a little bit it makes it hard, but it also makes it a little bit easy for you of, hey, I can address this thing and take care of it. And I'm choosing not to. So that's what I was kind of getting at within that mentality aspect of it is you have the power to decide how stressed you are or how much you're going to let it affect you to a certain degree. So I think that it is very powerful to say, hey, remove it, because some of us might be like, it's not that easy. But honestly, it might be that easy. It's still hard. But it is that easy at the same time. So when that's not an option versus when that is an option, can you walk through that a little bit? Yeah. And so and that when it is an option, when it not when it's not an option, that can be a very thin line and it can mm -hmm. also morph over time. But a really simple example of like a stress that I think most, if not everyone could remove from their life is let's say every Friday night you go and eat a cheeseburger and then you basically have gas the entire night the next day you feel brain fog you can barely get up in the morning you feel like you're hung over um well something's probably going on and that is a stress that response in and of itself in your body is stressful to it regardless of even if any of those initial responses are stress which they likely are that's something that's a good example of like don't do the burger anymore. You, you eliminate eating the burger. Maybe you try to solve it in a different way, like maybe it needs a gluten-free bun, or maybe you need to avoid certain things, certain spices that you're sensitive to, or maybe you just need to eat pizza. I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> the that is a good example of completely being able to eliminate a stress that you immediately identify. But I mean, even that one, people are not going to necessarily want to give up their cheeseburger on Friday night. Um, another one is just like, if you're training six days a week and you're not making progress and you're feeling really run down, training is a stress. Stress is how we grow necessarily. You need to stress an organism to get it to adapt. And if you do too much of that and you can't recover, that's another stress that you can easily eliminate by taking your training down to four days or three days or anything that you can recover from. So those are examples of when you can um, remove a stress pretty, pretty easily. And you have a lot of control over those situations and they're not going to, um, like your wife or husband or spouse is not going to likely have a problem with you working out less if it means that you're going to be healthier, <laughs> that type of thing. Yeah. And a few other examples, just because I'm kind of pulling from ones that clients have expressed is like, Hey, I'm stressed about hitting my food. All right, pre-plan it. That's going to take away a ton of the stress and decision fatigue. Um, I know I personally am like, oh my gosh, I'm stressed about stuff that needs to get done around the house. All right, now I need to make a plan. I need to make sure that I can do it and get it done. Um, I know that right now, a lot of us might be stressed about taxes. And I find that, yes, I'm going to have stress about taxes. I don't think that is personally going to change. But what I can do is be proactive, get the documents in that I need to, and get that done so it's not sitting there on my plate. Because I know for me, I get more stress if I have something on my daily to-do list, because I have daily, weekly, monthly to-do list. I have something on my daily to-do list that keeps moving to the next day, and I have to keep writing it down on the next day. The stress that I'm inflicting on myself by just not doing that thing 
gets very, very high. So that's a perfect example of like remove it or just address it and do it kind of thing of, hey, I'm letting this take hold in my life. Why don't I just go ahead and do something about it? Or maybe even you're stressed about your health. You can do something about that. You can make that change and make that shift instead of sitting there and allowing the stress to wreak even probably more havoc on your hormones and your body and so on and so forth. So let's go ahead and talk about when you cannot remove a stressor and some examples of that as well. Yeah. So and this is always kind of tongue in cheek because even on the stressors that you can't really remove, you kind of can. Um, Mm -hmm. So For instance, a really good one is like a toxic work environment and at your job. And let's say like that doesn't necessarily even mean that it's toxic in general. It could just be not right for you. It could be stressful for you. And I mean, we've talked about this before on other podcasts and just um, in passing. But I have had that exact experience where work was a very active stress. And I wouldn't say it's toxic for everyone that was working there, but it was certainly toxic for me. And that stress was eliminated um, by changing careers and it takes time, right? And it took a plan and it took many mistakes along the way. But that's a really good example of where you do an audit on your stress. And if you say, oh man, my job is really stressing me out. Like it's a toxic work environment, all these things. No, you cannot necessarily quit tomorrow. But what you can do is very similar to what you were saying, Sue, with kind of household chores kind of coming up. It's like you you make a plan and you do it. And that may not be a plan that is executed in a matter of hours. It may be years, but you're still moving towards productivity and kind of using self-empowerment and self-responsibility to change your circumstances. So that's one of like the kind of gray areas And then we have finally the stresses that we kind of talked about when you listed the five, like if a family member passes away, that is a stress that you cannot remove from your life. And unfortunately, with those stresses, they are kind of something that each of us has to deal with the way that we we best deal with it. And um, I find for myself, that's usually digging my heels in and going through whatever that stress is and kind of just acknowledging that it is part of how life goes and I can't delete it. And there's only so much management around stress. And that's just kind of when you have to go through a process um, that kind of gets you from point A to point B, however that may look for each person. Yeah. And I love that you talked about, especially in the work environment example or just a work um, example of that self-responsibility. And that's something that I feel extremely strongly about. I have very little sympathy for people who complain and don't do anything. Um, They don't try to make a change. They don't try to make an effort and they're complaining constantly. First, all of us know what it's like to be around someone who is just a chronic complainer. And most of the time you're like, oh my gosh, I do not want to hang out with that person. They just complain all the freaking time. And it's so annoying, but it's also stressful for you to go through because you might give them, oh, let's do this. And they're like, no, just things are hard. That's just how life is. And it's like, oh my gosh, no, I I can't stand where your headspace is at right now. And that's causing me more stress. And I know because I've been a chronic complainer before of the stress that that takes into my daily life. And so when you're looking at that aspect of, oh, I really don't like my job environment, X, Y, and Z, how much are you contributing to that? And so I always look inward before I look outward of even within our own business, within and PD, hey, I might see X, Y, and Z that I want to address right away of something someone else is doing wrong. And before I ever point the finger or talk to a person, I look at, hey, was I clear with my communication? Was I clear with my expectations? Did I give proper feedback? Was I allowing this to happen by the way I was acting? And the more that you can take ownership and to dig into yourself and figure out and have that self-awareness, the better things are going to get. Because if you sit and stew and like life is out to get you and things are stressful and you can't change your life, 
You can't change your life. If you have that mentality, you've already decided you can't change anything. And so truly taking ownership, having self-awareness and being able to say, hey, I know that I could do better in X, Y, and Z. So before I present this issue to someone else, I'm going to proactively do this. If they don't change, I'm going to have the conversation. Or if the situation doesn't change, I'm going to have the conversation. And then I'm going to move that forward. That's not only going to help you grow as a human being, which is going to be great. It's also going to help your environment of what's going on grow, whether it's a relationship or your work environment, whatever it may be, that's going to improve because you've put that effort in. You've seen where maybe you've done wrong because none of us are perfect. And so not that you should just allow people to stomp on you or to be bad people and you just keep trying and trying and no one else put effort forward. Of course, I'm not saying that. But I am saying before you complain, before you think of an issue, before you um, present a solution or not a solution, a problem, think about what your role in it was and what you could change about it before you go pointing the finger as far as what everyone else is doing. Because maybe you're contributing to that toxic work environment. Maybe your mindset is contributing and you need to switch your mindset to even be proactive in that environment. So instead of thinking, oh, they just told me I should just quit because I had a toxic work environment. We're not saying that. You might need to. That might be the case. But more often than not, you might need to change something personally to be able to take that step forward. But again, in Caleb's situation, it was the right decision to change careers and to be able to take the time, map it out, and do what he knew was best. Because Caleb knew, hey, I can't sit here and just complain about how how unhappy I am. My wife isn't going to be happy with that. She's going to be annoyed. (laughs) And everyone else, I'm going to alienate everyone else, and I'm going to continue to be unhappy. And so instead of thinking, oh, that's just how life goes. I'm already in my career. I'm doing it. He was like, you know what? I I can do something about this. So I am going to do something about it. And he did. And so that's something else I think is really important to hone in on is that self-responsibility and that self-auditing and that self-reflection, that self-awareness, because it starts with you more often than not. Yeah. And it's, uh, I'll, I'll say one thing too, about when I was transitioning, the reason it took years to transition from my old career job to what I'm doing now is that it wasn't that I was planning really slowly to exit. It was that I was trying to make things better, see where the source of discomfort was coming from. And eventually, after years of of kind of peeling away layers at that, I kind of realized that it's like, I think that I just don't want to do this every day. And that over time, then I was like, okay, well, now let's start moving away from it. And then I'll also say all of the things that Sue just said, it's important to kind of meet it head on and say that none of that is actually going to make your life easier, but it is likely going to make your life more rewarding and enriching and better is is my opinion on it. But I know that when I've kind of taken big steps to have more responsibility and like, I mean, even this week, I reached out to sue for some help with something. And in her response of helping me, there were a few light bulbs that went off where I was like, I think I can show up better here and do a better job without needing any external help. And it's like, that's not easy. It's not comfortable. Usually the first step is less comfortable, which is why we don't do it in the first place. But the end result is truly less stress and more reward. Yeah. And I will say, I know you said like, it's not necessarily making things easy. And I do agree with that in the terms that you used it, but it is also something where you get to choose how hard your life is to a certain degree. You don't get to choose every scenario, everything that happens to you. I'm not saying that by any means, but it is something where I used to be living a life that I was very unhappy in. I was I was not the person that I am today. And I had to take like extreme ownership of what the fuck am I doing? And why am I telling everyone else that my life sucks and I'm not doing anything about it? And so that's something that within um, all of that, it wasn't easy to go through all of those transitions. But I would say that 
I have an easier path, not that my life is easy, I still have a lot of heart that goes through, but I have a path of less resistance because I've addressed those different things standing in my path. So I agree that it's not going to be easy, but you're going to have less resistance and be more aligned as a human being. And I think anyone listening to this who has become more aligned has been like, oh my gosh, it's like this huge weight lifted off my shoulders of now I feel the way that like I, I feel aligned. And that's such a powerful feeling instead of that constant friction. Um, so I thought that that was worth kind of sidestepping over. Yes, definitely. Um, but now looking at stress management a little bit closer, oftentimes when we are super high stress is when we're like, oh my gosh, I need to do something about it. And that's like your body and your mind and everything telling you, hey, address me, address me, address me. It's like this red light going off. And so oftentimes that's when we Google how to manage stress. And then (laughs) this whole list of things come up and you're like, I need to do everything right away and all my stress is going to melt away. And I'm sure some of you have experienced that. Maybe you have go ahead and done a meditation or done some journaling and you do feel better in that case. But Caleb, is that something that you should wait until you're uber stressed to even address it? Or is that something you should possibly have a routine in place? And why would that be beneficial to have it in place beforehand? Yeah, I think that um, stress management should be a routine based thing that we do every day and we're proactive about no matter what. So if you're going to meditate, I would advise meditating for every well every day. And then you're not really looking for at least this is my personal experience and my experience with clients is that. I don't particularly think that just onboarding a meditation routine for two weeks does a lot. I think that you get a little bit of a boost and then you kind of start to be like, why am I doing this? And I think it takes a lot longer to really see the benefits. And a lot of those benefits don't necessarily get noticed because you're less stressed. So you might, let's say you meditate for 90 days and then something stressful happens and you just deal with it. And that kind of stress management, all that stuff that you've been doing did play a role in making that you're like basically making your ability to deal with it, to just deal with it a little bit easier. And so I really, I really am a strong advocate for that approach for find the pieces of stress management that work for you because meditation doesn't work for everyone. Um, journaling might not be everyone's cup of tea, but there are so many ways that we can reduce stress. And when we take it from a proactive, um, a proactive setting, you don't need like the biggest hammer of stress relief to get through your stress. You can use little tiny pieces over and over and over again every day and build up a resiliency to your stresses. And then you can manage the acute ones as they come a little more easily. Yeah. And I love that you said that, especially in regards to like when something does come up, then you're able to handle it a little bit better. And you might even be like, I don't need this anymore because like life's good. And it's like, no, life's good because you are doing that. And that's something I really hammer into clients is um, oftentimes when we when life is going good is when we kind of drop out some of those routines. And then when life starts to go bad, we're like, oh, my gosh, I should start doing yoga. And then you're like trying to like retroactively get the stuff done that you know you needed to, but now you're stressed. So fitting it into your routine feels even harder. And then you can't even manage that stress while you're trying to do that stress technique because you're so overstressed. And so that is something where oftentimes sleep and stress management, which sleep and stress management are like two huge movers and your body. Like if you want to see any results in your body and not to say that, oh, everyone wants a complete physique change, but if you want your body to respond optimally, your sleep and stress are two things that you a hundred percent need nailed down. And they are two things people just do not think are important all of the time. And now that I have realized how important they are, I'm like, oh my gosh, I used to be that person that used to think that that these weren't important. These are like two of my like closest to the heart that I'm like, this is for my health. This makes me feel good. This allows me to show up my best. And I know a lot of you guys listening really want to see fat loss or muscle gain. If you are not prioritizing your stress management and your sleep, 
those things are going to either not come or be very slow and very hard to come by. And so if you're not doing it for anything else, at least do it to reach your goals. (laughs) Um, If you don't want to pay attention to the health benefits, be able to think, oh, I want to lose fat. I'm going to go ahead and get my sleep and stress under it. But that is true of like you get so stressed and then it's hard to fit in those things. And then you're not in the routine of it and it makes it so difficult. And so like Caleb said, not every stress technique is for everyone and you don't need to do all of them. You don't need to be like every five hours of my morning, I'm going to go do yoga. Then I'm going to meditate. Then I'm going to journal. Then I'm going to do a puzzle. Then I'm going to go for a walk. Then I'm going to listen to something like no one has that time to spend five hours doing all of that every single morning. And it's not going to work for every single person. So a really important thing to take away from this is it is going to take some trial and error. You're not going to find the perfect answer to your stress in one podcast episode and trying one thing, you personally are going to have to address a lot of things. And I want to make that very clear because I want to make sure that this podcast and just PD in general is telling you the truth and giving you the nitty gritty of what needs to happen. I can give you, Caleb can give you stress management techniques, can talk about how important it is to manage your stress, the effects of stress on your body. We can say that till we're blue in the face, but that's not going to help you if you don't know you have to do something too. You have to look at your life and see where are my stress pockets? What am I stressed about and what do I need to do? And to find a technique that works for you, it's going to take trial and error. So it's going to take hey, I'm going to go for a walk for a whole week and see if that makes me feel better. And it might even be that that didn't make you feel better because maybe you need to do your walk at a different time of the day or you needed to structure it a little bit different. So it's going to take trial and error. But the other aspect is you have to be so honest with yourself about where your stress is coming from to also be able to address it. Because if I look at things, someone else might not think, hey, getting better time management or organization is going to like is a stress management technique. It sure as heck is for me of like my stress starts to get real high if I have bad communication and bad organization, not only within like where my stuff is in my house, um, where it drives me crazy or I can't find anything. But if I have bad professional organization within anything that I'm doing, my stress gets so much higher. And so looking at that is going to be really important as well. Mm hmm. Um, So when we start looking at our last resort for stress management, what does that look like? Yeah. So, I mean, the last resort is kind of like, let's say you have a really big acute stress that comes down on you. Um, And I don't want to use the loss of a family member one again, because I've just like keep going back to it. But I mean, (laughs) that's the only one I remember from the (laughs) from the five off the top of my head right now. There's one. One of the big, big stressors is moving. You're moving. Let's say you're moving and you're um, getting annoyed at your dad because he's not giving you proper instructions for moving a couch and he's just doing it on the fly. I just made that up. It's not personal or anything. Um, And that's stressful. And let's say it's just a whole stressful day and you have to move. You can't delete it. Right. And then you have your stress management strategies in place, but it's just feeling particularly stressful. And that's going to happen no matter how much stress hacking or stress management you do daily. Sometimes these things happen. So you're moving. What do you do? How do you reduce the effects of that? And that's where that kind of one off treatment works a little bit better. And I would say like the bigger hammers are are kind of more appropriate at that time. But I mean, anything like a So let's say you just finished moving and everyone leaves and you kind of are settled in with boxes instead of just going right into it. It might be helpful to like take a brisk walk. That would be a good one. Or it could be helpful to like leave the house and go play. Like maybe you play a racket sport or you're going to go swimming or play basketball or something like that. Right. Like basically you just want something that's going to take you out of that kind of frantic, manic, worrying state or kind of edgy state and into the present. So it could also be doing something like artistic, like I am i don't have that patience yet in myself to sit down and do something artsy, but um, lots of people do. So that could be something you do. And Sue, you said puzzles. So I assume that you mm-hmm. probably do puzzles. Um, yes, but yeah, but like even so something where it kind of 
like meditation is really hard in these scenarios because you it's a very skill based stress management thing. And that's why it's so important to do it every single day, because when you meditate, the practice of practicing that skill is what you're getting benefit from. Whereas if you're super stressed about moving and you sit down to meditate, your thoughts could scramble. It could be really hard to kind of like wrangle in all of that. So it's better to do something that kind of forces you to be present. If you're on the basketball court and someone passes the ball to you and you're thinking about all the stress of work, it's just going to hit you in the face and that's not (laughs) going to work. Right. So those are really effective stress management. And that's kind of when we want to use those acute, like kind of when we want to bring down acute stress. And then what's what that's doing is it's not eliminating your stress and it's not kind of getting rid of the moving stress. But what it's doing is it's giving you a break. It's taking you away from that really agitated state. And it's giving you a release and also giving your body time to just kind of recover body, brain, whatever. And then you can come back to that situation that might be stressful and address it properly or however you need to to get through it or simply just have a better mindset coming back to it. Yeah. So we've obviously mentioned a few like uh, more popular stress techniques of yoga, meditating, going on a walk, stre- like um, we said a few journaling. Um, we've said a few of those and you might have clicked on this episode because it said like ta- talking about stress management or stress management techniques. And you're like, okay, I already know those. So let's go ahead and talk through a little bit of like what you personally do. And I'll talk after of like things that I do that have really helped my stress just to see it in a real life environment. And also see, like I mentioned of like, it's not always going to be those like ones that everyone talks about. It could be something else depending on the person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, Well, I guess I'll start. Um, But so what I do with stress management is, first of all, and I'm sure that Sue's is similar to this, is I get good sleep. Sleep is is so important. It's when we heal from the day and we can just process things, right? Um, And our body will process things for us. That's a nice thing. You don't have to do any work. Um, So good sleep, good sleep hygiene, all of that stuff. Before I even leave my room in the morning, I start my stress management. So I do 15 minutes of Tai Chi every morning before I even open the door to the bedroom, before the dog can come in and disrupt me. My wife's usually up a little earlier, so already out of the bedroom. And I do that. Then I go downstairs and I journal with my coffee um, and do that kind of ritual So that's what I do to kind of start my day and then I will get into work and I just have like my own kind of method for how I need to get in the state for work. But those are my two main things in the morning because what I want to do is I want to slow down. I'm and this is I'll I'll just kind of talk to why I do these because it is very specific to each person. So I find that if I don't do these these actions, what I'll do is I will race downstairs put food on, put coffee on, not drink any water, and just basically act very compulsively for a good two hours. And then all of a sudden realize that my day is gone with scrolling and eating. And I usually eat things that I just like don't really want to eat. So this helps me to slow down before I start my day and really engage slowly. And then I'll do work and all of that. And I have normal things like taking the dog for a walk and all that. And then at the end of my work day, what I'll always do is I will go for a walk alone, just like a short 10 minute walk along around the block, because I just kind of want to be in my own head. I don't listen to music or anything for that walk or podcasts. It's just like complete silence, focus on just walking. And those are kind of my main stress management, um, things that I do every single day. And I make sure that that's part of my routine. It's really hard. Um, I try to do 100 days straight of each of these things and then kind of reward myself for those. And then if I kind of break it, I start over and try to set goals like that just to keep me going. But yeah, that's how I do it. Um, And that's just based on my kind of compulsive personality um, traits where if I'm not conscious and I'm not grounded and present, things go off the rails a little bit. So 
Well, I think that's perfect for you to point out at the end there of, hey, that's because I know about myself. I am a little bit more compulsive. I know if I do that this way, then it doesn't serve me in my day. And that probably didn't come from you just trying one thing one day. It was you learning about yourself, your tendencies, what makes you tick, and what you truly need to address. Any time before, like these past few years that I addressed stress was a lot of Band-Aids that I was putting on because I wasn't addressing the root of the issue of truly looking inward and being so extremely honest with myself about what I was and wasn't doing or what I did or didn't need. So I think that is the perfect example of saying, hey, this is what I found out about myself, my tendencies, um, how compulsive I am, and these are things that help me slow down. So that's something I highly, highly, highly encourage you to do. It's something I really push on clients is when you start doing something and you feel good from it, make a note about why you feel good or what that made you feel. So I had a client recently, we were trying to get into a routine of something, we were having a hard time, and I laid out, I was like, I want you to try this, this, and this, and then like report back to how you felt and what that looked like and then we'll make a plan for how it'll fit into your life moving forward. And so she was like, oh my gosh, I love waking up and starting the day with a walk. I just feel so fresh and I'm doing X and I'm doing Z. And we went through the whole thing and she was like, I don't know why I have a hard time sticking with these habits. I said, completely understand you there. Let's take a look at when was the last time you even reflected on how these habits made you feel. So I made her write down for the whole week each time she did something that made her feel good, I made her take a note of it and then write down why it made her feel good. So then the next time she had the tendency to go ahead and skip that, she had to be faced with looking at that note of this makes me feel X, Y, and Z, and I'm choosing not to do it. So that's kind of a little bit of a fail safe for you. If you feel like, oh, I know that these habits make me feel better. I just have a hard time getting in the routine of doing them. That's something so, so helpful. So talking through kind of my stress relieving techniques. I'm going to talk through a few that might seem a little bit more unorthodox or might not be talked about when you say like here's stress management and then talk about a few that are a little bit more like normal in regards to, I don't want to say normal, like mine are abnormal, but you know what I'm saying. So for me, I'm going to start with my routine of some things that Caleb had mentioned where sleep is huge, getting a good night of sleep, having a good sleep environment and paying attention to that. If your sleep, I could go on a tangent and I might, I'm just warning you. If your sleep is I could talk about sleep all day long, but outside of that, if you're like, my sleep sucks and you're not looking at, hey, my mattress might need to be replaced. I might need to get a new pillow, new sheets. I might have to wash my sheets more often. (laughs) I might need blackout blinds in my room. And I say that and Caleb is laughing because he also has a dog where our dog is on our bed. And I'm like, we need to wash the sheets every single day, basically. (laughs) Um, And like all these different things that you need to take into account where I know people who have been on the same mattress for years and years and they don't get good night of sleep and they're like, well, I don't want to spend the money on a mattress. I feel you. I do. But at the same time, I don't feel you at all. I just don't because the amount of time we spend on a mattress and sleeping throughout our lives is very high and you're choosing to have a subpar version of that for the rest of your life, knowing it that it affects your hormones, it affects your mood, it affects your m- ability to think and be creative and to have concentration and focus. It affects your ability to lose fat, to gain muscle, and so many other things. You're choosing that. So that was my little tangent about sleep. But sleep is a huge one that I prioritize, even including water where my body feels better when I have water, that's something that I can manage my stress while having my body run more optimally. So that's a huge thing for me as any way that I can have my body function more optimally is going to minimize stress. Because again, think of um, a well-oiled machine versus a machine that you need a douse in WD-40. That well-oiled machine is going to feel a little bit less stress than that machine that literally needs you to WD-40 it every single day. 
So think of it in that way of like, oh, that friction that's caused by things not being optimal, um, that can really weigh on you throughout your, your life. Another thing is paying attention to the foods that I eat. Now that I specifically say, because I've talked about where my digestion is at of the issues I've had in the past. And especially with Caleb bringing up like that cheeseburger, making you feel sluggish. Not that we're saying you should restrict fast food or you should never go get a cheeseburger. We're saying pay attention to what, how things make you feel. If the cheeseburger doesn't make you feel good, yes, it could be that you're eating too fast, that there's a multitude of other factors there, but it could be something of I need a gluten-free bun or red meat doesn't sit well with me or I need to not have cheese on my burger. It might be something like that where you just need to be able to be honest with what food makes you feel good. And I can tell you, I lived for 20 something years eating food that didn't make me feel good. And that's why I'm so passionate about it because I never made a change. And when I finally did, I was like, oh my freaking goodness, I am just a little bit of an idiot there. Um, so paying attention to the food that I'm eating and how that makes me feel. Um, so each morning I wake up and I start my day with doing five to 15 minutes of yoga. I found that I was often trying to replicate or copy what I saw like when YouTube videos or people's posts, they'll be like five habits of a successful person or um, how billionaires start their day or whatever it may be. And I would try to copy that or try to look um, to people I looked up to and try to copy what they were doing. And I found out, again, it took a lot of trial and error of a lot of things weren't for me. I know a lot of people who like to read in the morning and I freaking love reading. But my problem is if I start the day reading, all I want to do the rest of the day is read. And so I can't start the day reading because I know myself and I had to be honest with myself of, hey, that's actually very distracting for you. And it doesn't put you in a good headspace because you literally don't want to do any of your work throughout the whole entire day. And so it's something of, okay, the reading doesn't work for me and spending a very long morning routine doesn't work for me because I'm the most productive in the morning. And I have a few things time-wise as far as cardio and making breakfast that I have to also pay attention to within the morning. And so five to 15 minutes, that makes it long enough to get the benefit, but short enough to not take away from my productivity. I start the day with that five to 15 minutes of yoga, and then I go ahead and do a gratefulness list. And I just write three or more things that I'm grateful for that day. Because if you're having anger or you're having frustration or just having a bad headspace going into the day, journaling or doing a gratefulness list can really set the intention or meditation if you need to set the intention that way to be able to start the day. So not only am I making my body feel better because I'm working on some mobility. I'm making my mind feel better because I'm focusing on what's good in my life instead of looking at it from a negative lens. So those are things that I do every morning. Then another thing for stress management is I have a cutoff time for work. So it's not just work until the work is done because then I would never stop working. There's always more to be done. So Alex and I have a very strict cutoff time of, hey, by 8 p.m. you are away from your computer and we are winding down because we have a very strict bedtime of 10 p.m. And so we know... If we need to wind down and eat our last meal and spend time together, we need that two hours. And so that's how we've set things up. Now, talking about a few other things that you might not think about are stress relieving, but are extremely stress relieving, are um, – getting my affairs in order. So what I mean by that is I used to live an extremely chaotic life. I used to think that structure, I worked better with chaos and that structure wasn't good for me and I needed a little bit of crazy. Turns out I was just making excuses or I didn't even know how good I could feel. I don't know which one it was. But like for me, making to-do lists is very helpful and having like a shared Google calendar for Alex and I because I was feeling stress of not knowing what his schedule was, what he had going Going on that day and I would ask him and then I wouldn't remember everything and then I would get stressed out about that and we have a lot of things that we have to do together as far as meetings or um, just I need to be aware of what his schedule is so that was a huge thing for me of having a Google calendar and having a shared Google calendar so that we could have everything on there see what was going on and understand the other person's schedule and then to-do lists are huge for me of I write out my to-do list the night before or early in the morning depending on kind of what all's going on and I have my to-do list for the day and then I have a monthly to-do list. So I'm realizing, hey, these aren't all going to get done in this day. They just need to get done by the end of this month. Um, so that helps me have those 
it all written out. Um, and then I also have different things put in place, like I talked about as far as organization and time management um, of uh, for our business even, what we put into place of using Slack instead of using texting and emailing as much. That has been huge for my stress of just recognizing, and it had to be something I figured out of, hey, I'm getting stressed and I'm getting resent, um, having resent full feelings of like when people text me because when I am away from my computer is when I have my phone with me because I try not to look at my phone when I'm on my computer. And then I'm like, I don't want to be doing work. And that was something where I was like, oh, instead of getting upset with people, why don't I just change how it's done? Um, and we put Slack together and it's been like life changing for me. I freaking love it. Um, and then like organization within like my Gmail inbox and the way that I communicate are all things that are stress management um, and techniques to use because you again have to look at yourself where Caleb said, hey, I know these things work for me because I have a c- compulsions and because I know how my brain works. He wasn't able to figure those out to actually benefit his day until he figured out what was going on internally. So same for myself is, hey, I found out that, hey, actually you have ADHD. So your thought of like everything being chaotic is actually the fact that your brain doesn't have any organization. So then I had to compensate by making sure I had that organization in place. So knowing about yourself is going to help you with your stress so, so, so much. So instead of just sitting here and being like, yeah, you should do yoga and you should do um, a journal and you should go for a walk and you should do X, Y, and Z, we're saying you should probably do some of those things. But you should also look at what truly is causing the stress because it's often not that um, like you just need like just a few minutes for yourself. It could be that, but you might also need to look at how your life is run and how you're contributing to your stress as a whole. Um, And the last thing I want to say on that, just because I know I have gotten a little passionate, um, but rightfully so, this is a very important topic, um, is that when it comes to uh, your stress and your stress response to something, um, again, it's going to take time. It's not going to all happen with one thing. It's not going to be perfect the first time you try it. You're going to have trial and error. You're going to fail. You're going to find things that don't work. But instead of getting discouraged by that, just think, hey, I found one thing, one thing that doesn't work. Now I know what not to do. And that's always helpful to look at things in that regard as well. Um, And I had something else to say, but I forgot it. So I'm just going (laughs) to, you know, pass it over to Caleb. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny that you mentioned the ADHD thing, too, because that is what came (laughs) helped me personally, because I had that happen. um, Honestly, not even two years ago, figured that out. Um, And that's part of why I do like Tai Chi instead of meditation, because I'm not I'm moving my body and that like, so just another example of like how fine tuned these things can become as you learn more and more about yourself. But um, we've kind of been alluding to this and I think it's just worth, and you've said it actually blatantly too, but I mean, it all starts with looking inward and, and kind of doing that work inside. And that is what's gonna inform you a lot about how things work for you from stress management and also basically in the whole realm of fitness you're going to figure out a lot a lot about what works for you and life just by looking inward so that should be like kind of an overarching requirement of all stress management is that we do it with a lens of looking inward Mm -hmm. i think that's great um, so I hope that you guys took a lot from this because I think it, w- it, it covered a lot of bases um, of being able to tell you about what impact stress has on your body. And I, there's more that I didn't mention, but stress has a large impact on your body. And like Caleb has mentioned, stress can be good and you do need stress to be able to change, but it matters how much stress is going on. Is it acute? Is it chronic? Is it even unknown that that stress is happening? Um, and being able to 
dig into that and look inward and figure out what that next step is. Because again, we can't tell you the perfect next step, but we can give you information on why it's important to address and then give you some options to use as your next step. And it is something that I started at the beginning of this episode and I didn't really finish talking about. But as far as making that list of your top five to 10 stressors of what to do next with that is going through and seeing, can I do something about this or can I not? And so that's something that is a um, forget the word. It's something I have clients do. And it is something that once they go through it, they're often like, oh, I guess that there was a lot that I could change, a lot that actually didn't need to be a stress. And then there is some that I have to recognize that that's how life is. Um, or I just need to deal with it and figure out what my next step is there. And so that can be extremely helpful of just becoming more aware of why you're stressed. So the next time someone asks you like, hey, how are you doing? You don't have to answer like, oh, I'm good. I'm just stressed (laughs) or things are stressful right now. You have more of an answer and that doesn't have to be your default. And that's something else that I will say before we get off here is that within this world, within this landscape of where we're at, and I was about to say within the United States, but Caleb is not in the United States. So I'll say within North America, (laughs) um, it it is something where um, we often feel like we need to be like other people. And we have a hard time disassociating from the fact that we don't need to be that way. And what I mean by that in regards to stress is that we live in a world that it's very normal to just be like, oh, yeah, I'm stressed. And so we normalize that and say it all the time. And I've found myself saying, oh, yeah, I'm stressed when I'm not even actually stressed just because I feel like that's the norm. That's the default. That's what I should say. That's how I should feel. And there was a time where someone asked me like, oh, are you stressed about that? And I was like, oh, no. And they were so taken aback that I I wasn't vocalizing my stress towards it. And I thought that was so powerful to think about because, again, we normalize not feeling good with our food. We normalize our bodies not functioning optimally functioning optimally, and we normalize stress to the nth degree. And so if you are the upteenth degree, I was thinking like to the end, you know, upteenth degree. And so when you get out of that normalization and truly reflect, that's also going to give you a lot of power and time and just, you know, peace of mind back into your life as a whole. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to add anything because I just could talk <laughs> forever. <laughs> Well, as you can see, we're very passionate. So if you guys have other questions or want us to go more in depth or do an episode answering your questions, then go ahead and check the show notes. There's going to be a Google form and you can go ahead and submit that. And Caleb and I will jump back on and go over all of that. But thank you so much for joining today, Caleb. I think that this was invaluable and just being able to get that out there and, you know, look at yourself and fix your stress. Yes. I was going to, you know, try to say something a little bit more catchy. And then I just, that was it. So it's a great catchphrase. We can make a shirt. Yeah. Uh, something like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much. Bye.